Hey there, I'm Jonathan Larson. I'm an extension entomologist with the University of Kentucky and I'm an amateur videographer here today. I'm going to try and keep this as steady as possible to cut down on motion sickness, but I am excited to be in one of our high tunnels at the South Farm here today. Talk to you just a little bit about some of the insect pests that we can deal with in situations like these. This is going to be kind of a mixture of videos like this and some slides that I'll mix in there to show you some good pictures because luckily we've got slim pickings here in our high tunnels. There aren't a lot of bugs that seem to be bothering our plants. We've had spats with aphids in here. Um, there's a lot of different things buzzing above my head right now, but none of them are pestiferous. I see a lot of bumblebees and honeybees kind of stuck in here right now and a lot of different flies in particular. So when we talk about high tunnels, I think they're pretty popular. I think we see a lot of folks switching to them nowadays or implementing them with some of the extra funds that they're getting. And I think that's a really great thing. I think it's an awesome opportunity for some of these folks to extend the growing season, extend their economic opportunities. And I think in the past when we've talked about high tunnels or hoop houses, there's been lots of conversations about what are the entomological aspects of this. I think some people in the past have thought that surely this would be kind of like a force field. All this plastic that you see around me would keep some of the insects at bay. But you got to remember that you're bringing plant material in at different points in the year, that you're opening the high tunnel up. You can see some of those openings behind me here. The door behind me is open. And insects, they're pretty good at finding these kinds of entry points and taking advantage of them. The other problem is that once they get inside, they're a little too dumb to be able to get themselves back out. So they usually just decide, uh, I guess I live here now, and uh, take up residence in your high tunnel. All those flies and things that are buzzing above me kind of find themselves in that exact situation. All the different things about a high tunnel that we like for our plants, that kind of consistent heat and humidity, the ability to control that environment and provide a safe harborage for these plants, is also afforded to any insect that gets in here. And so because of those opportunities and because of that safety, what we've seen in some research at places like Purdue is actually that once insects get in here, if they're pests, they actually seem to do better in high tunnels than they do in field situations. There is some research with Rick Foster and a few other scientists up there, Elizabeth Long, I can't remember all their names, but what they found is that um, once pests get in here, they do better, and we actually see higher populations in high tunnels for certain pests than we do in the field. One in particular that I remember was the tomato hornworm. So usually that's kind of a sporadic pest in a large tomato operation. We get them in gardens and things like that. But what they found is that if the moths were able to get into the high tunnel and lay their eggs, that there were lots, lots more of those caterpillars in here munching down on those plants and attacking all those delicious tomato stalks. And they lost a lot of crops because of it. The same was true of diamondback moth. There was also cucumber beetle issues inside the high tunnels. And so it's not gonna be easy all the time. I think I've heard Dr. Rudolph mention a few times before that there is a honeymoon period where you don't seem to have any bugs or problems in the high tunnel, but that after a certain period of time, you're gonna end up with them in there and they're gonna be quite successful because you're giving them kind of a nice little island in a very hostile world. The other things about that nice little island though is it offers us a lot of control. You can exert your will, your human will, over this interior scape more than you could outside. So part of that is that you can quarantine things, something we're all very familiar with at this point is when you're bringing in plant material, if you're planting new and there's old stock in there, or if you are just getting started, what you want to do is take those plants that you've got and put them on a table separate from everything else and just monitor them. Look for insects that are on there. Look for some of the different insects that we're going to talk about here today. If you find them hanging out on there, you can control them before you implant them. You can wash them off. You can just try to do it really simply. But you're definitely keeping them away from your other, uh, other stock so you're not infesting the whole high tunnel kind of all at once. So quarantining is good. Monitoring whenever you open it up is of course going to be key. Dr. Besson is going to talk to you today about how to monitor and scout for pests, talk about some of the symptoms probably, some of the different tools that we use for that. That's always going to be very helpful when you're opening the doors, opening the, the, the sides of the tunnel. you got to remember that bugs are going to start coming in at that point. There's going to be lots of different insects that can come in. Some of them are good, some of them are bad. I can't go through all the pests with you here this morning on just this little short video, but I can try and cover for you some of the bigger ones. So we're going to talk about aphids. We're going to talk about white flies and we're going to talk about thrips. So we'll start here with aphids, also known as plant lice, according to some folks, just because of the prodigious numbers of them that we can see and the way that they feed. There are several dozen species you can encounter in a high tunnel, but all of them are phloem feeders, which means that they use that needle-like mouth part you see on the left side 
of the screen to plug into the plant and siphon out fluids that they digest and turn into their nutrition. Aphids can be differentiated from some of the other pests by that needle-like mouth part, by their kind of puffed up rice shape, as well as the cornicles that you see marked with that orange arrow. These are these exhaust pipe looking structures on the rear end of the abdomen. They're part of their defensive alert system. They can send an alert pheromone out from those to warn the other aphids that danger is nearby. Aphids all generally have this same shape and size that we can see. Um, they have different colors though. Some of them are black that we've seen in the high tunnels. Some of them are red. Many of them are green, but we can also see some that are kind of this yellow orange color which help us to see that black cornicle on the rear end of the abdomen there. But you can see that they plug into the plant and they begin feeding. Some of the things that you're gonna monitor for with aphids are exuvia. If you look on that left-hand image, you'll see a white exoskeleton. That's an old exoskeleton that's been shed by a, an accumulating population of aphids. You'll see lots of those if the population is building. You'll also see deformed leaves as they feed and suck those juices out. The leaves will cup over and curl, and the aphids are actually hiding inside of there. And we'll see honeydew, this sticky water that accumulates on the leaves of the plant and attracts black sooty mold. To monitor for these, look for these symptoms. Use some of the tools that you're going to learn about here in a few minutes from Dr. Besson, things like yellow sticky cards, to monitor for them. But also pay special attention to any new plants you're bringing in and those weeds that may be encroaching. Up next, we have thrips. Thrips are very small, about 1 25th of an inch in length. They can develop very quickly and become a pest at a huge level very quickly. They go through their whole generation in about 7 to 14 days, depending on temperature. Kind of this yellowish orange color, as you see here, kind of pencil shaped overall, flat on top with a pointy tip. And then their wings have these odd fringe structures that come off of them, kind of like a 1970s Davy Jones kind of jacket. The populations that we encounter are mainly females. They're the ones that are inserting 150 to 300 eggs into the leaves to try and build these populations up. They have asymmetrical mouth parts as adults. They use one side to slice into the plant and then the other side sucks the juices out and it can create very systemic damage that we can see uh, here, systematic damage that we see here. And on the far right side, you're seeing a face only a mother could love, kind of horrifying looking organisms. Their feeding leads to deformed leaves that are kind of cupped and curled. You can see decaying flowers, the silvery flecks and scars that we've zoomed in on here in this picture, as well as their fecal material, which are sort of a black, oily looking structure. Because of the way they feed, they can also pick up diseases and pass them along. Thrips can be prevented by sanitation, by checking infested plants and moving them out or excluding them entirely and avoiding certain colors of clothes. If you wear a lot of blue, white, or yellow, thrips are more likely to land on you and then they could follow you into the high tunnel and get loose on your plant. That leaves white flies. These are sucking pests that can stunt plants. They vector viruses. They produce a lot of honeydew, tend to live under the leaves and develop over the course of about a month. They have sedentary immatures that look a lot like a scale insect and then winged adults. The two most common species that I've seen so far in high tunnels are greenhouse and silverleaf whiteflies. Silverleaf whiteflies are also known as the sweet potato whitefly. Greenhouse whiteflies hold their wings flat over the top of their body, generating an overall triangular shape. And then their uh, immatures have long hairs that come off their body. The sweet potato or silverleaf whitefly holds their wing at an angle like a tent. There's a gap between their wings, and their nymphs tend to have very little hair on their body. You can keep some of these insects at bay by keeping the weeds at bay as we've mentioned a couple times. If you have a nice strip like you see in this video here around the high tunnel to keep the weeds from touching the structure, you're taking away a natural bridge that they might use to enter. Of course that's just one management method that you can use. There's lots of other IPM tools that you can focus on like insecticidal options. Scan that QR code and you'll get a table that includes all of those. We have biological control options like this lady beetle. Actually, I have a graduate student working on this. If you want to know more about these kinds of tools and more about management methods, hit me up after today's webinar with your questions.
So that's it for me from here in the high tunnel today. Hope you learned a little bit of something about the insect pests that you can encounter in these kinds of agricultural situations. I'm always available for help and consultation. If you got some pictures or just some questions, you can send them my way through email, jonathan.larson at uky.edu. You can also find me on Twitter if you're active there, at bugmanjohn, and I take samples through either of those avenues. So good luck with your growing season, and we hope to hear from you soon.